Uh, so Acts chapter 17, and uh, what does it mean when it says it's called the book of Acts? Well, it's the acts or the actions of the Holy Spirit working, God working through the lives of ordinary people. What did God do? Now, uh, two weeks ago, and of course last week was Easter, and the week before that we had communion of the Lord's Supper, so really three weeks ago. Uh, we began in Acts chapter 17 and looked at verses 1 through 4. Uh, and I want to um, just kind of review just very briefly with that, and then we're going to go right into the day's message. Now, a huge part in most Christianity that is missing is that we have made Christianity into something that's all about feelings. Now, is there emotion and feeling in our love for God? Sure. Is there emotion and feeling in coming, a person coming to Christ as Savior? Absolutely. Is, it a, is there emotions and feelings in how we serve God and, and, and when we worship God? And Yes, it is. But for the most part, what we have done in Christianity in America is we've made it too many times about feelings and not enough about thinking and reason and logic. And so in Acts chapter 17, we'll put this on the screen. I'll go through this very briefly. Paul, as his custom was, went into them, and for the three Sabbaths, what did he do? He reasoned with them from the Scriptures, explaining and demonstrating that the Christ had to suffer and rise again from the dead. So in the beginning of Acts chapter 17, God introduces to us, and this is how you got to think about this, is that the Bible is God's Word. And so God gave us these words. God spoke through men that were inspired by the Holy Spirit. God breathed into them the words that He wanted them to write down, and they did. And so God wants us to pause here and understand that part of the Christian faith, a big part that's been pushed aside, is reasoning. Now, the next thing we'll put on the screen is learning truth by reasoning, which is conversation with questions and answers. It is explaining. It is opening thoughtful understanding, demonstrating, showing, or proving. That's why in a lot of the times in my presentation of sharing the truth of God's Word with you, I'll ask questions because I want to get you to think about and pause and say, oh, what about that? Oh, how, let's think about that. How, is that. Is that not only biblical or theological, but that's also logical, and that makes sense. And now, yeah, I can see how that works in life, and it all starts, all the parts of the puzzle starts coming together if you're a thinking person and not just base it on your feelings. Now, the next, the foundation of reasoning and logic must be founded in truth. You just can't have reasoning and logic without some foundation of where you get your truth from. And there's only one truth, and that's God's Word. Psalm 119, 160 says, The entirety of your word is truth. 2 Samuel 7, 28 says, Now, O Lord God, you are God and your words are true. John 17, 17 says, sanctify them by your truth. Your word is truth. Now, the world today doesn't know what truth is. They're totally confused. They don't even know what a woman is. They don't even know. They be, they're asked the question, can a man become pregnant? And they're baffled as to what the answer might be. So they're lost. So, the beginning of Acts chapter 17, and you should say, okay, I see what's going on here. God wants us to understand, to put on our thinking caps, and just think through common logical reasoning when it comes to how God made the universe, all the faculties of life, and how things work in life. Don't just run your life off your emotions and your feelings, because cook. Can you trust your emotions and feelings? The answer, no. They fluctuate up and down all the time. So that's what we looked at at the beginning of Acts 17. Let's pray and get started with today's message as we continue in Acts 17. Father, this is the word that you've given me. I don't have a word, God. It's your word. I'm just a messenger boy here today to 
read through your word, and hopefully my desire and my heart is it will open the minds and hearts of the people here so that they would want to follow you, believe in you, fall in love with you, live for you, and build their life around you. And in doing so, the result is they'll find the best life. There is no better life than the life lived with God because that's what we were created to live for. We were created to be in relationship with you, and when that relationship is severed, the soul is always searching, never finding real peace on the inside. So speak to everyone's heart here today. Let us open up our minds and hear your word. Open up our hearts and feel your presence. In Jesus' name I pray, amen and amen. Billions of people struggle every day with, in many cases, unnecessary problems. Now, we all have problems. Problems are just a part of life. We never know from one day to the next what the issue is going to be, but we all deal with situations and issues and problems. It's just a part of life. But if you look closely at the lives of many people, there are everyday problems that we all encounter, and then there's problems that are really unnecessary problems. Problems that we bring on upon ourselves. Problems that are self-inflicted. Problems where if we'd have made a different choice or a different decision, we wouldn't even be dealing with this problem. Problems where we presuppose what's going to happen, although it's never happened. Don't you like people when they talk about, well, what about if this happens? Well, We'll cross that bridge when we get to it. Why just get yourself all worked up and uh, get yourself worried sick about something that hasn't even, even happened yet, but that's what people do. And part of the reason why there's these unnecessary problems is that people believe the wrong things. They get their mind locked onto something and they think it's right and it's not right. They want it to be right. And here's the key. Sometimes that people have all these unnecessary problems because they believe things that are not right, and then when you ask them about it, you say, well, why do you believe that? Crickets, no answer. Well, why is it that you feel that way? Well, what, what do you base your facts on? Here's what happens with people is that a lot of times they'll, they'll take a stand or a position on something and you ask them, well, what do you have? What do you, why do you believe that? I don't know. What facts do you have to back that up? Uh, well, I really don't have any facts to back that up. That's just what I feel. They have no facts to support what they say they believe. And if you ask a lot of people a questions, here's what will happen is, if you say, well, why do you believe that? Typically, let me tell you what a lot of people believe. It's based off of hearsay. They heard somebody say something, they said something, that somebody told somebody something, and they told them, and they told this other person, and it got to them, and they say, oh, I believe that. Based off what they feel. A lot of people have, they, they, a lot of people, it's amazing that they will get locked in on something just because they heard somebody else at work say it or somebody told them that and they say, yeah, that's it. Believing things without, listen to me, examining the facts is the world in which we live today. I watch all sorts of interesting, I like to keep up with current events and why people do what they do and I'm just, just completely just blown away on all the interviews they have today with people where they asked them again, can a man get pregnant? And they're like, well, I'm not a biologist, or I don't, I'm not a doctor. I just think, what is, what is wrong with people that they could think that way? So they have no facts to defend their position. And you have been, those of you that's been with me for years since we've been at this church, uh, since what, 2013, the, uh, one of the things you've heard me talk about on occasion is that I, I say this, that I have met very few 
in my entire life what I would consider free-thinking people. Now, some of you are going to think, well, I'm a free-thinking person. So my question is, are you? Because here's how that I identify a free-thinking person. In your life, this is a circle of your life, and in your life you were raised by parents that the parents taught you certain things. They were your beliefs. You went to school, you learned certain things. You hang around with the kids in the neighborhood, you learn certain things. You went to college, you learn certain things. You, you, you around friends, you learn certain things. And now you've formed a belief system in your life based on all of these things. Now the free-thinking person does this. They step outside of that circle and they look at all of those things and they say, are those things really true or not? And if so, based off of what? Now, I've shared with you how it's so easy for kids to develop likes and beliefs in their life. My, I've shared this with you before. I'll share it again. My father loved the Dallas Cowboys. Loved them. I know all you Redskin fans, you know, you're like, boo. So we would have to watch. So I grew up, buddy, when the football game come on, everybody better be quiet. It was like church service in our house to watch the football game. You ask my father, because my father builds racing engines. That's what he's done. He's 88 years old, and he still builds semi-professional racing engines for race cars. Okay? You ask him what kind of motor to run, he'll tell you, you better get a Chevy. And Chevy's the best. It's the fastest. So I grew up, and I thought everybody should love the Dallas Cowboys and drive a Chevy. I, that was in my mind. That, I mean, because that's what I learned. My buddy down the street, his dad loved Fords and loved the Washington Redskins. I'm like, how could he do that? It just doesn't make sense. So we get, even from our parents, we get things that we believe, but the free-thinking person steps outside of that, of what they've been taught, and they said, let's examine the facts. When I went to Bible college, the professor would be teaching certain things, and uh, I was a thorn in their side. I would raise my hand about every few seconds. What is it, Rick? What's your question? I'm like, well, you just said such and such. Do you have any proof text to back that up? We're, we're, don't just say things that you don't have the, the facts to, to back up what you say that we're supposed to believe. And see, spiritually minded people base their life on examining facts. And the sequence of real Christianity is not feelings. Let me tell you the sequence of Christianity. It is. Facts, faith, then feelings. That's the sequence. When you come to Christ, the first thing if somebody does is somebody is presented with some facts about what? Jesus. Somebody is presented with Bible facts. Somebody comes to church and hears a preacher. Somebody be begins to be confronted with some evidence that Jesus came to this earth, died on the cross, gave His life for our sins, so we don't have to die for our sins. Jesus did it for us. He resurrected from the grave. So you, you, ha you hear some facts. And then from those facts, you do what? You decide if you're going to put your what? Your faith in it. Your belief in it. And then after that, it's the feelings. But in our world today of Christianity, it has become feelings, feelings, feelings. So we come to Acts chapter 17 verses 10 through 15, and God introduces to us to teach us that we should be people that search out and examine facts, evidence, truth, not just base everything on our feelings. So there was a, a town called Berea. And in this town, they were people there were called Bereans. And this was Berea actually is still a town or city, I should say. It's in northern Greece. It's still there. It's about 50,000 people. It has a new name. Verera is the new name, but it's the same location, same town, same city, 
still there today in northern Greece. So Paul and Silas, the two apostles, they leave Thessalonica, which was another town, another city. They walk about 40-some miles. They get to Berea. Here's what God tells us. Acts chapter 17, 10 through 15. Here's what God says. Ministering at Berea. Then the brethren immediately sent Paul and Silas away by night to Berea. When they arrived, they went into the synagogue of the Jews. Now, here's the description of these people. These were more fair-minded, some translations say noble, than those in Thessalonica. In that, they received the word with all readiness and searched the Scriptures daily to find out whether these things were so. Therefore, many of them believed, and also not a few of the Greeks, prominent women as well as men, But when the Jews from Thessalonica learned that the word of God was preached by Paul at Berea, they came there also and stirred up the crowds or stirred up trouble. Then immediately the brethren sent Paul away to go to the sea, but both Silas and Timothy remained there. Now, Paul and Silas was at Thessalonica in the beginning of, which is again another town of the city, beginning of, Acts chapter 17. It didn't go very well there, and they left. And uh, however, just as a side note, uh, you have the book of Thessalonians in your Bible, first and, Thess- first and Second Thessalonians. That actually, uh, most of the New Testament were letters that were written to churches. They, we call them epistles, but they're really just letters that God inspired Paul and other people, Peter, to write to these churches, uh, and this was where they were at at one time. So now they leave, again, Thessalonica, and they go to Berea. And when they get there, they go to the Jewish synagogue, and they, in, the, in those times, in those days, they had kind of like an open dialogue about things. You could stand up, you could talk, you could share things. And uh, when they get there, what took place is that Paul and Silas says, Listen, Jesus is the Messiah. He's the Messiah. I want to tell you why He's the Messiah. All these thousands of years that that we were waiting for the Messiah, He's come. He died on the cross. He was resurrected from the grave. We saw Him alive. Almost close to maybe a thousand people saw Him alive. And all of these things, they, they they present this to Him. Now, Here's what these people did, and here's what God is telling us to learn from these people. In verse 11, we go back to this. And it says, they were more fair-minded that those in Thessalonica, that they received the word. In other words, they listened to what they had to say. They received it. They said, okay, what is it? And then they said, we're going to go and do what? We're going to examine the facts. We're going to We're going to search the Scriptures to find out whether or not what Paul and Silas is telling us is actually true. So the majority of these people were what? Free thinkers. In other words, they just didn't believe based on what someone else said or what suited them or based on their feeling or this or that. They said, let's just go and let's go back into the Old Testament. Let's look at what's logical, reasonable. Let's get the evidence and see, in fact, if it's true. And they search the Scriptures. Now, at this period of time, the Bible that you have was not the Bible that they had back then because at this period of time, there was no printing press there were few copies of the Old Testament. Now, the Old Testament had been around for hundreds and not thousands of years. And so they didn't have everybody like today. Still today, the number one selling book in the world is what? The Bible. Still. People don't believe in God, but the number one selling book in the world every year is the Bible, the Word of God. So they didn't have a New Testament like we have today. They just had the Old Testament, so they got together. Obviously, at least one or more people had a copy of the Old Testament. They began to read, they began to talk, they began to examine, 
whether or not, and here was the million dollar question, if Jesus was the Messiah. That's what they wanted to know. Is Jesus that Paul's talking about, was he indeed the Messiah? Now, what does the word Messiah mean? Glad you asked. I can put it on screen. Messiah comes from the Hebrew word that means anointed one or chosen one. The Greek equivalent is the word Christos or in English, Christ. So the name Jesus Christ is the same as Jesus the Messiah. They were looking for the anointed one of God or the chosen one from God to come and to lead their people. Now, what did the Bereans do? Well, they said, we will take a look. And again, there was, it was 400 years between the Old Testament and the New Testament. 400 years of silence from God to His people. So they said, let's go back into the Old Testament and let's just see indeed if Jesus fits the facts of being the Messiah, the Christ, the anointed one from God. Now, I'm going to go through a pretty lengthy list, about 25. Now, there is hundreds. Now, I don't have time because we'd be here for a long time for me to pause on each one of these and explain them. But I'm just going to give you, I want you to get a feel for the facts where it talks about Jesus in the Old Testament. I'm going to read through them very rapidly. The first verse that when we get to it, is it will tell you where the location is at in the Old Testament. And then the next one beside it will tell you where it actually it happened in the New Testament. So here we go. This is going to give you a glimpse of what they went back and studied and found. Here we go. Number one. The Messiah would be born of a woman, Genesis 3.15. Number two, the Messiah would be born in Bethlehem, Micah 5.2. The Messiah would be born of a virgin, Isaiah 7.14. The Messiah would come from the line of Abraham, Genesis 12.3. The Messiah would be heir to King David's throne, 2 Samuel 7.12-13. The Messiah would spend a season in Egypt, Hosea chapter 11, verse 1. The Messiah would be rejected by his own people, Psalm 69, 8, Isaiah 53, 3. The Messiah would be declared the Son of God, Psalm 2, 7. The Messiah would be called a Nazarene, Isaiah 11, 1. The Messiah would be sent to heal the brokenhearted, Isaiah 61, 1 through 2. The Messiah would be called King, Psalm 2, 6, number 12. Messiah would be called a king, number 12. Messiah would enter Jerusalem on a donkey, Zechariah 11, 12. Messiah would be betrayed, Psalm 41, 9. Messiah's price money would be used to buy a potter's field. That was the 30 pieces of silver, Zechariah 11, 12. The Messiah would be falsely accused, Psalm 35, 11. The Messiah would be silent before his accusers, Isaiah 53, 7. When Jesus was bought before Pilate, what? He was silent. M Messiah would be spat upon and struck, Isaiah 56, Messiah would be hated without cause, Psalm 35, 19. The Messiah would be crucified with criminals, Isaiah 53, 12. Messiah's hands and feet would be pierced, Psalms 22, 16. The Messiah would be mocked and ridiculed, Psalm 22, 7 through 8. The Messiah's bones would not be broken, Exodus 12, 46. Messiah would be buried with the rich, Isaiah 53, 9. The Messiah would resurrect from the dead, Psalm 16, 10. The Messiah would return a second time, Daniel 7, 13 and 14. Now that's coming. and not come yet. Now, that's just scratching the surface. Is Jesus in the Old Testament? All over it. Every chapter. So, what happened? They go back, they examine the facts. Now they got one group telling them, the Thessalonians heard that Paul and Silas was at Berea, and they didn't like it. You see, any time in, in political situations, people is going to lose power. They want to always silence the ones that they think is going to cause them to lose power. Like I've told you over the last couple of months, you can always just about identify what real truth is 
by what the government is trying to do what? Silence. You can always just about say, yep, that must be the truth because the government don't want it. Don't want it. So they examine the facts and then in verse 12, here's the results. Therefore, many of them did what? They believed. And also not a few of the Greeks, but prominent women as well as men. So they were fair-minded. They searched out the facts. They, after they looked at the facts, they said, hey, this has got to be true. You know what the odds are? As a matter of fact, there are scholars that have gone through the entire Old Testament and this list that I gave you, about 25, again, there's hundreds. And they said the probability of a person coming and fulfilling every one of those things the probability is millions and millions to one that one man could come to the earth and fulfill every one of those details about his life. It's improbable. But he did. Now, what's the application to our life today? How do we apply this to our life? First, I think God is telling us very clearly that we need to be free-thinking people and examine the facts, the evidence of life. If you're a new Christian, there's a book out. The author's name is Josh McDowell. Josh McDowell has a series of books called Evidence That Demands a Verdict. If you don't have that book, I would encourage you to get it and read it. He's, there's about three or four volumes. The first volume came out probably 25 years ago, maybe longer. And I used to have multiple copies in my library. So Josh McDowell's story was that he was going to college to be an attorney. True story. But he met a girl, and she was pretty, and he liked her. So she invited him to go to their Bible college on uh, campus. He was not a Christian. Matter of fact, he hated, he hated, hated Christianity. Hated God, didn't believe in God. And because he had a very severe childhood, his father and him had a very volatile childhood situation. But he went with her because she was a pretty girl. He said, well, I'll go. And he said the story is, is he went to the, these, these Bible groups and he just sit there. And he said he was just so emotionally just kind of angry. And he said what he decided to do, again, he's, he's going to school to be an attorney or lawyer. He said he was going to actually investigate the facts. And he was going to gather all these facts and he's going to come back to that Bible group so that he could prove to them that Jesus was nobody. And all this God stuff and all this Jesus stuff was just nonsense. And so he says that he took his lawyering skills that he was learning and while he was in university and he started applying them and he started just examining not just the Bible, but all of the external facts of the history of Christ and the history of the church and all this sort of thing. Well, guess what happened? When he began to examine the facts, he said it just broke him down. The more he examined, the more facts that he revealed and, and to himself through study, he come to the conclusion that Jesus was everything that he said he was, the truth. And he became a Christian. You see what happens when you examine the facts. Most people today, they don't want to do that. So first, God wants us to be people to look at the evidence. And you have people in your life that say, well, I don't believe in any of that. Well, just go get that book for them. Evidence that demands a verdict. Let them read it. And it presents all of the historical documentation, archaeological documentation, all the facts, all the biblical things, things that uh, about Jesus. I was uh, home uh, Wednesday because I had some plans. I had to get drawn for a job that I was getting ready to do. And usually when I'm home working on plans, I don't like to be bothered because I'm trying to get my work done. And, uh, you know, I have to tell my wife, shut the door, leave me alone. <laughs> she 
she wants to get me to go off and go. I said, honey, I got to work. So uh, I'm working away, and uh, my wife said, hey, a car just pulled in the driveway, and two ladies are getting out, and they're walking up to the door. I said, oh, no, I ain't got time for this today. I'm busy. You ever be so busy, and you're like, I know I should talk to these people, but I just don't have time. I got to go. And uh, so I looked out the window, and I knew right away, I said, uh, they're going to be Jehovah Witness. Here we go. So my wife said, uh, well, I'm not going to the door. Uh, I said, well, that's rude. I'm going to at least let them get to the front porch. So uh, I walked down on the front porch, and they were very nice people. And uh, well, that conversation where I had no time lasted about 45 minutes. And uh, I very nicely as nicely and as, as I could because for me, I'm not trying to win the battle to prove them wrong and me right. I'm trying to get to their heart so that they will open their eyes and come to the knowledge of the true Jesus. So through a, through a series of conversations, you know, I very nicely told them they were a call, and here's why. You deny the deity of Jesus Christ. You don't believe Jesus is God. That's number one. I said, and so they said, well, our Bible says, so, well, here's the, here's the facts. Let me lay out some facts for you. I said, there is 5,000, maybe five between five and seven ancient New Testament Bible manuscripts. They're in the Museum of London. They're at the Smithsonian. I mean, they go, they're dated way back. They're ancient manuscripts. The words are written down. Nobody's going in there to the Smithsonian with a big eraser and changing the words. They are what they are. And I said, it's interesting that out of all the Bibles, I said, the Jehovah Witness didn't like what the real Bible said, so they made up their own Bible. And in their Bible, they go through and change all these words around and they deny that Jesus is God. John chapter 1, verse 1, they change that all around because it says Jesus is God. They don't believe in hell. You know, Russell was the founder of Jehovah Witness, so I'm just going off on telling them all this stuff. And they're just looking at me like, this guy is nuts. So I just tell them, I said, look, I know all about it. Russell was the founder. This is what happened. Russell didn't believe in hell because he was scared of going to hell. But the Bible says there's hell. There's more in hell than there is about heaven in the Bible. And I'm just, just going through the verses. They ain't saying nothing. And, uh, and I said, so I said, uh, I said, what you believe is untrue. I said, have you ever really examined the facts? What's the facts? The truth. I said, how could your Bible be right and all the rest of the thousands that are out there are all wrong with yours. Does that make sense to you? But no, you, you changed it. So then I got to the most important question to him. I said, okay, I said, I could sit here for an hour or more and I could go through and I could probably tell you everything about what you already believe and what you think. Because see, they believe that you work your way into heaven. It's a, it's a faith thing. And you ain't going to go to heaven no way unless you're one of the 144,000 <laughs> So you're already doomed. <laughs> so it's a, it's a mess. So I, I asked him, the, I said, listen, let's set all that aside. So here's my question for you. I said, you believe that what you believe is right and true? They said, yes, we do. I said, good. If you passed out right now, hit the ground, would you go to heaven? The lady said, well, we hope we would. I said, ah, that's the difference between you and me and true Christianity. I said, when a person is truly saved and they know Christ is their Savior, it's not a hope so. I said, that's what it is with the Jehovah Witness. I said, you think you're going to go out and work your, work your way by, by your faith is by your works. And in doing so, you're going to gain favor with God. And I said, so you're working, hoping that one day you get to heaven. I said, if I hit the ground right now, don't worry about me. 
I said, I'm going to heaven. And that's an absolute certain. They said, how do you know that? I said, I know that because the facts of the Bible say that. And then I quoted them this verse right here. You ought to know this in your Bible. 1 John 5, 13. These things I've written to you. God says, I have written all of these words in my book, in my Bible to you who believe in the name of the Son of God that you may know that you have eternal life. That you may know, not that you hope, not that maybe you might get to heaven. What we believe in Jesus is not based off what we do, it's what He did for us, that we may what? Know. If you put your faith and trust and belief with your heart in Christ as your Savior, you can know that you have eternal life. Not I hope one day I make it. And when I told them that verse, they were ready to get in their car and leave. So I witnessed to them the best I could to try to get them to see the facts. What's the facts? I told them, I said, if you got some facts that you can present to me, I'm all ears. What you got? And they have none. So God wants us to be people that put the work in, study the facts, question things, examine the evidence. And let me tell you what happens in the end result. Confidence, when you know that you know the truth. And listen, a lot of unnecessary problems in life goes away. Could you imagine where our nation would be right now if the people leading this country would really understand what the facts of life is? I watched this, this gentleman in a video this week, and here's what he said. He said, uh, he said, the problem with America today is America got away from its Christian values and principles. He said, even people that were not churchgoers had Christian values and principles. We learned, we, we knew basic things. We knew basic right and wrong. We knew that you didn't kill other people. You don't mug other people. You don't loot stores. And you don't, you know, we, we, we know that God made us and God gave us life. There was values that even non-Christian people had. He said, we've lost that. It's a thing of the past. And it's because they don't, want to consider the facts. So, we could have a better world. You can have a better life if you stop disbelieving what you feel and look at what the truth of God really says. What does it say? Examine the facts. And many of the life issues of depression and worry and fear, the Jehovah Witness left and they're thinking when they're driving down the road, I'm nervous. I wonder if I'm going to go to heaven. I walk back into my house. I'm not nervous. I'm not fearful. Because I know I'm going to heaven. Not because I deserve it. Not because I've earned it. Not because of anything that I've done in my life in any way to get favor with God. Because if I was God, I wouldn't have saved me. But God loves us. And He saves us in spite of who we are. God loves us. And that's an amazing thing. That in all the mistakes and flaws and things, I look back at my life and think, Woo! if I was God, I'd have kicked me to the curb a long time ago. But He didn't. Because He loves us. These things have been written unto you that you may know that you have eternal life. Let's bow for prayer. Father, thank You for the truth of Your Word. And I pray, God, that within our church today, we will not only have adults that come that examine the truth and know the truth, but, God, our children that we're raising through this church will not get caught up in the lies of the world. We see children and teenagers' lives being wrecked, being indoctrinated, going to universities and schools that teach them just complete lies from hell that's ruining their life. 
God, we pray for the children in this church that we can raise up children and teens that will be grounded in the truth of God, and in doing so, they will find the best life. They will find a life of purpose and a life of knowing you. And so I pray, God, our challenge today to myself and everyone here is that we will be people that search the truth, do what the Bereans did, search the truth. Heads are bowed, eyes are closed, no one looking around. Here's the the question that I asked to the Jehovah Witness ladies, I asked to you, if today was your last day on this earth, where would you spend your eternity? Heaven or hell? It's one of two places. People say frequently, how could a loving God send anyone to hell? He doesn't. People send themselves there. It's a choice. It's a decision you have to make. God doesn't just say, you're damned to hell. No. You have to decide. God's free love, His eternal life, His forgiveness of sin is offered to everyone. But you have to accept it because love is something that has to be accepted. Can't be forced. So if the day was your last day on this earth, where would you spend your eternity? Heaven or hell? You say, I don't know. I don't know for sure. How can I become a child of God? How can I put my faith and trust in Christ and become a child of God and have that assurance that you read to us about this morning? God made it very easy. Here's the facts. All you have to do is first be repented of your sins. And what that means is you got to realize you're a sinner, admit you're a sinner to God. And you got to say, God, I'm turning away from the world and I'm turning away from the, all that the world offers, and I just turn to you, and I put my belief and faith that Jesus is exactly who He said He is, the Son of God, and He died for me, and I ask for forgiveness of my sins, and I believe He resurrected from the grave, and all that He says He is, I put my faith and trust in it, and I put Him, and I want Him to be my Savior. That's it. It's such a simple thing, but yet people have such a hard time doing it because it requires getting through your pride because pride says, I'm not a bad person. Pride says, I don't, I don't need that. I can do it myself. You can't. It's pride. Make that decision today. Have that conversation with God in just a moment. And put your faith and trust in Him. And then Christian, don't go through life just basing what you believe on just your feelings. Do what the Bereans did. Examine, search, learn. Be able to give people, when somebody comes knocking on your door, be able to talk to them about the truth of God's Word. So with heads bowed and eyes closed and we're looking around, I just guess this is our time where everyone here, right where you're seated, I don't ask people to come forward. You just whisper and pray and God can hear you when you're whispering right where you're at. And just whatever you need to talk to God about. Maybe you need to talk to God about something completely different than what I preached about. Maybe there's a need or burden in your life and you just got to ask God for help. Whatever that is, everyone just take a moment. You just pray right where you're seated. God is listening. You pray. Father, thank you for our opportunity to come here each week. I thank you for this church. I thank you for the privilege of being the pastor of this church. And Lord God, I just pray blessings upon this congregation that we will grow and the people will leave here and go out and share what they've learned on Sunday with others. Go out to their family, go out to their friends, share the truth with others. And Lord, just uh, put your hand of blessing on all the marriages and all the children And let us be the light that you want us to be in a world that's just lost its way. Thank you again for this time we have together in Christ's name. Amen and amen.